So good evening, everyone. Thank you to come for coming to the third of our lecture series, the Helen D'Amico Memorial Lecture Series, hosted by the Institute for Medieval Studies. Um, this lecture series is um, framed by the theme, Re-envisioning the Middle Ages. And so tonight we will have another talk by one of our four stellar scholars um, to help us kind of re-envision, think anew about medieval topics. Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that UNM was founded in 1889 and sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia, the original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache, since time immemorial, have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. As we learned last night um, about our deep history that crosses paths perhaps, or at least chronologies with the rest of the world during the middle ages period, time periods. Um, I wanna talk just for a minute again about Helen D'Amico. Um, I've, I've mentioned that she is our great founder um, of the Institute and this series, and we miss her dearly. We were excited to um, memorialize her with naming the series after her last year. So this is our second annual Helen D'Amico Memorial Lecture Series and our 36th annual um, Institute for Medieval Studies Spring Lecture Series. So we have a great history here and you are all part of that. So I am deeply grateful for you being here as we you know, slowly get back into a new normal um, after the last few years of COVID and being more homebound. So it's delightful to see you here. Um, I wanna thank uh, my medieval colleagues, all the faculty in English history um, and music and in the college of um, the Honors College and also um, the deans of those colleges, Dean Mafi, Dean Smith, Dean Gonzalez of this college, who's allowed us to use this beautiful space. Um, and who else am I missing? Dean Lau, um, and all of the departments that support us here at the university. Um, as you can tell, we have a really nice kind of outreach through the university and community. And we're so happy um, that we have this great community to share these wonderful topics with you. Um, and I can you tell I didn't, I lost my notes. <laughs> so I'm, like, I'm going through my head. Um, and I'm not as clever as some others who uh, usually memorize their, uh, their intros. So I will leave it there and um, know that you're gonna have a wonderful time tonight. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Jonathan Secord, who, sorry, Jonathan Davis Secord, who will introduce our speaker, um, Dr. Matthew Vernon tonight. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Andrews. And uh, welcome, good evening, friends. I am delighted to introduce to you Dr. Matthew X. Vernon, Associate Professor of English Literature at the University of California, Davis. Dr. Vernon earned his PhD at Yale after earning his MA and MPhil in Yale at, in English and Medieval Studies simultaneously, which I found impressive and he passes off very humbly. <laughs> Dr. Vernon's work routinely spans millennia. For example, analyzing the medieval works of Gerald of Wales with modern paradigms derived from post-colonial theory and black studies. He also brings modern literature into conversation with medieval Arthurian materials. For example, in his studies of Kazuo Ishiguro's The Buried Giant and N.K. Jemisin's The City We Became. He has uncovered instances of the post-truth phenomenon we know so well from Twitter, in 19th century novels about slavery. And his work extends to comic studies and the cinematic adaptations of comics, which has become so central to modern entertainment culture. Dr. Vernon's book, The Black Middle Ages, Race and the Construction of the Middle Ages, appeared with Paul Grave Macmillan in 2018. It is a strong description of the development of the modern myth of the all white European Middle Ages 
but also the ways in which African-American authors undercut and rejected that myth. It is a strong reminder of the ways in which the medieval period continues to influence the modern world. And it is a call for the need to expose the modern misappropriations of the medieval. Tonight, Dr. Vernon will talk to us about Everybody, a play by Brandon Jacobs Jenkins adapting the medieval play Every Man. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Matthew Expert. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I need to, to ask you for that later on. So I can, <laughs> I, can, I can keep it close to my heart, put it above my bed or at night or something like that. And I want to thank everyone for being so warm and kind to me, uh, particularly Professor Andrews, who's been extremely hospitable, exceptionally hospitable. Uh, so as a note, uh, this work is going to be, uh, as was just uh, said, about Brandon Jacob Jenkins' 2018 play, Everybody, which is an adaptation of every man. And at first, this won't seem like a medieval talk, but please bear with me. I, I hope it will coalesce. Uh, so, Brandon Jacobs Jenkins begins his play in Octoroon with a, ra a radical act of visibility. The character BJJ opens the play on stage mostly, if not completely nude, with a deceptively unassuming line. Hey everybody, I'm a Black playwright. The line and stage directions indicate a vulnerability linked to a problematic essentialization that much of his play centers on. The question of what constitutes a Black playwright the character admits that he does not know exactly what that means, broadens into a meditation of what constitutes blackness and particularly what are the means of making real the evanescent nature of race. In this respect, Jacob Jenkins' choice of a 19th century Dion, uh, play, Dion Boussicot's The Octoroon, is a particularly canny one in dramatic and historical terms. The source play, uh, concerns Zoe, an enslaved woman caught between the affections of two slave owners, George and McCluskey. Osiko goes to great lengths to distinguish between George, the young and handsome paramour of Zoe, and McCluskey, the violent and unscrupulous usurper seeking to take George's land and marry Zoe. On one hand, George is kind to the point of being hapless, and on the other, McCluskey is brutal to the point of committing murder to complete his scheme. Nonetheless, Jacob Jenkins' play tasks the same actor with playing both roles. That is, despite the claim of being a Black playwright, the actor playing BJJ is tasked with portraying two white slave-owning characters, and you can sort of see the white face here, a move which evokes the, and subverts the history of Blackface performance. In sending up the legacy of such racial performances, the play intervenes in the discourse of what constitutes the minutia of Blackness with a rhetorical shrug, not only are the expected racial roles inverted, the titular Octoroon Zoe disappears entirely from the stage before the play is over. She flees into a swamp with poison as she prepares to commit suicide, believing that she has been sold to a new slave owner. One of the enslaved characters who witnesses her dramatic departure simply says, she ain't worth it. The obsessive interest in the singular and tragic position of someone on the cusp of integration into white society is sidelined for the more pressing concerns of national complicity in slavery's crimes and the, lived, uh, and the lives of enslaved who do not have the opportunity to pass. The alleged universality that comes from Zoe's proximity to whiteness is outright rejected in favor of a reorientation towards the sympathies of Black characters who do not live in the space that she occupies, the space of exception she occupies. These subversions of the visual matrix that contribute to the play's challenges, the white face and the casting of white passing and a white passing actress, which add layers of complexity and vitality to long get tropes, collude with the historical peculiarities the Octoroon brings with it. A photograph forms a vital bit of evidence in the original play, proving the innocent of a Native American man accused of murder and instead implicating the white slave owner. The device of the photograph as irrefutable and spectacular is a historical marker Jacob Jenkins preserves from his source material. The character BJJ says, um, uh, which is why the whole plot more or less centers around a camera. But photographs to us, boring, it's a cliche. But we've gotten so used to photographs and photographic information that we've basically learned how to fake them. So the kind of justice around which this whole thing hangs is actually a little dated. 
As was the case with the play's initial declaration, the humility of this line belies the enduring effects of photography spectacle, evidence of crimes, and means of surveillance in Black history. After BJJ uh, dismisses the photograph trope, another character uses a projector to, to display a photo of a lynching on the back wall of the theater. And I'm not going to do that for you here, but instead I'm going to use a photo from uh, a sort of altered photo that Ken Gonzalez Bay, this, uh, uh, this California artist made, or he makes a sort of series of these where he um, makes invisible black bodies and, re, uh, and gives you the sort of spectacle of the lynching without actually having the black body present in the, in the screen. You can still see that it reemphasizes the focus on the white people who are gathered there. Um, so he present, during the middle of the play, he presents this lynched body. The irrefutable fact of lynching and the significance of the lynching photograph as a crucial truth claim and evidence of a perverse pleasure in looking at violence done to Black bodies served to complicate the initial declaration of the play. Lynching photographs as a, are iconic in the sense of being dense with meaning and also broadly referential in terms of how they construct Black visuality. Discourses around how we see Blackness, the meanings we attach to Black people, and the value we attach to Black life because of this sight. Indeed, the potency of these images only grows in light of the proliferation of the technologies of surveillance, to use Steve Mann's term, which bespeaks the strategy to challenge the hierarchy of power implicit in surveillance. The proliferation of handheld and wearable cameras provide alternative perspectives to and crucial evidence against forces that have long held disproportionate power in informing against racialized bodies. The Black bird watcher filming a white woman appealing to her racial and gender positionality uh, to threaten him, or the bystander filming a police man slowly choking the life out of the prone Black man. The incident involving the Black bird watcher named Christian Ch Cooper is what the columnist Wesley Morris was referring to in the quote that begins this talk. And his line is arresting, uh, this line about the counterfactual is arresting, in part because of what he means by that counterfactual what it has to say about how Black life is made visible. The counterfactual that the camera provides functions as a strategy of resisting or inverting the assumption of Black criminality. The aggressor, I mean, Amy Cooper, who's unrelated, uh, called the police and said that she was being threatened by an African-American man, clearly intimating that her racial perceptions and the imagined threat were not the same. The video, which is viewed over 20 million times, gave vivid evidence of systemic racism, racism that often passes invisible to most Americans. However, there is a proleptic meaning Morris gives to the notion of the counterfactual. Morris refers to the foreknowledge of the possible circuits that lead to death if a Black person cannot account for their actions. The camera literally counters the facts of such fraught encounters and makes possible other endings besides death. Part of the horror of these moments is how mundane so many of these moments minutes before racial attacks are. A driver smoking a cigarette to calm his her nerves before a traffic stop, a boy walking home with buying candy, a man eating ice cream in his living room, an off-duty EMT sleeping next to her boyfriend, a father of six selling cigarettes. These people, Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, Boston Jean, Brianna Taylor, Eric Garner, become visible in the wake of known facts that brought about their murders. The certainty of criminality that is known and death arrives while these people are doing everyday things. Their death arrives unexpectedly and somehow paradoxically as part of a familiar pattern woven into our social fabric that makes it cohere rather than rending it. This talk is interested in the idea of the racial counterfactual, the strategies that, he, that, um, that must be developed to think through what it means to witness life as a counterfactual, to proleptically read, aware of possible endpoints and the possibilities of turning away from the closure that they pretend. Wrapped up in this issue, are, wrapped up in this are issues of temporality, visibility, media, and affect. My reading will center on Jacob Jenkins' subsequent play, Everybody, which paints his thinking on these issues in even brighter colors. The play draws upon the seeming universalism of the Middle English play, Every Man, to med meditate on the necropolitical meanings of dying while Black, and whether the stage can represent racialization differently than through the codes that have transformed Black deaths from a spectacular tragedy into a matter of fact. I propose that Brandon Jacob Jenkins' play, Everybody, extends and complicates the idea of a racial counterfactual he opens in the Octor Room by interrogating the relationships among Blackness, visibility, and materiality in necropolitics. What this offers is a speculative reorientation of his perspective on how Black life becomes visible, 
what racial matter looks like, and possible lineages for theorizing Black death. So to begin with, the play itself functions as a counterfactual. Early in this action, the actors participate in a lottery that decides their roles for the performance. This mechanic drew an assertive response from Ben Brantley, the New York Times drama critic, who read this as more of a gimmick than a successful choice on the part of the author. He writes, the entertainment value of everybody as an acting exercise would probably be enhanced if you could well see everybody playing everybody. But that would require buying many tickets and sitting through many, many hours of people translating medieval ontology into arch Latter-day vernacular, saying what is essentially the same thing again and again and again. This argument profoundly misses the possibilities held within the play's conceit. The blind choices of roles presents a significant problem in the context of the playwright's earlier work, which wrestles so overtly with the presentation of Black bodies, including that of the writer. This casting move does not eliminate race as a category for consideration, Rather, it deepens questions about race as inherently dramatic. To what extent do racial expectations become conflated with generic expectations? And what happens when race is made to appear in ways that do not emerge from mere appearance? That is, does not participate in either confirming racial expectations or catering to the expectations of white gazes. And Octoroon at times is at odds with a narrative that is engrafted upon. The fate of the tra tragic mulatta, as noted before, is overdetermined to the point that the play's attention wanders from it to the mundane concerns of other characters. Zoe's racial status is the drama in Bosico's The Octoroon, and is one that Jacob Jenkins has already seen too often. As a counterpoint, every man is an ideal play to deploy to extend an Octoroon's investment in the quotidian and how it is also invisibilized for a, li a liminal or extraordinary moments of blackness. Everybody stages a far more acute issue in questioning the premise of Black bodies being frictionlessly cast. Can anybody play everybody? Or more precisely for this play, can anybody inhabit a racialized body? What might it mean to attempt to resist the representational shorthand that makes race knowable on a stage? What does it mean to carry that gaze, uh, to try to gaze on a body as such when the meanings assigned to it are encoded in ways that are at odds with the physical presence before the audience. And as I will explain, Blackness and the universe of compounding meanings attached to it have to be renegotiated among broader critical moves. The, the play makes to posit race as a value as abstract as any of the allegorical ones everybody encounters on its way to death. Oops, sorry. Before, the, uh, before discussing the play, I think it's necessary to briefly outline the structure of everybody and its primary source text, the Middle English play, Every Man. And I should note that a good bit of this will draw from medievalist V.A. Colby's classic essay on Every Man, which has underpinned much of the play's criticism for decades after its publication. Both plays are, allegor are allegorical representations of an individual's accounting for their lives on the way to death. The plays have a bipartite structure. In the first half, every man or every body learns that the material or worldly things they treasure cannot accompany them to the afterlife. In the second half, every man or every body engages the help of virtues that can, uh, can indeed assist, assist them. The primary departure that everybody makes from every man is to include subconscious scenes in which an unnamed character's comment on the play as it proceeds as though every man is recounting a dream to them. Everybody is having a dream to them. Everybody in its source text, every man, are by their nature demotic in the sense that the subject, one's preparation for death, is as broadly applicable as possible and meant to be instructive. Jacob Jenkins goes through the through lengths, uh, through great lengths described above, to ensure these lengths here, to ensure that the characters seem to be deracialized. Moreover, the character of the usher, who quite literally ushers the audience into the play, further complicates potential racial dynamics by impact by uh, unpacking the global and the complex and global lineage of the work. And forgive my Dutch here, this is, uh, I, for some reason I cannot, I cannot get any Dutch. I, my, my tongue goes wonky with it. Um, let me see. It's based on another play from the 15th century called Every Man, which is one of the earliest recorded plays in the English language. Now for a while we, or you know, scholars, thought that this play was sort of collectively authored by a bunch of monks who loved to put on plays for each other in old-timey England. But we now know it was, in all likelihood, an adaptation of a slightly different Dutch play called Spiegel uh, der Zalheit van uh, Elkhoek, uh, and uh, about whose author we know nothing except his name is Peter. And it also seems like this Dutch play, Spiegel der Zalheit van uh, Elkhoek, uh, was itself based on a Buddhist fable. So who even knows where the Buddhists were getting their fables from? 
So Jacob Jenkins introduces this play in a way that destabilizes the potency of its medieval European roots. The middle English play is at once a point, an origin point for his own work, and also a continuation of a much deeper tradition that complicates such easy identification. This is to say, as a writer thinking about race's appearance, this play makes radical racial identification as a historical byproduct, an ever retreating lens through which to move the work. In this respect, drama's mimetic iterations across space and bodies form a vital part of his vision of how he mobilizes every man. At the same time, the temporal moves do another deeper kind of labor for the play. And here I want to briefly turn to the work of scholars Hazel Carby and Paul Gilroy and their attempts to reconceptualize the world of racial and ethnic common sense. Both of these writers narrate familiar moments of encounter along global circuits and narrative acts around them, narratives of slaves and slavers, reports of colonial administrators performing exceptional acts of violence and colonial critics mapping out the, uh, the broad pattern of killing as, uh, as, as the fabric of colonial rule while centering their gazes on blackness as a, cru a crucial mode note for informing other types of race making. Essential to their claims is constructing a trajectory through modernity into current, the current moment. Okay, so Carby writes, at which moment and in which text can we see a modern black subject narrated onto a stage of global history? How is that figure brought into being through narration and what are the terms and conditions that shape or determine its modernity? Is what we conceive as the modern subject produced out of the encounter between Africans and Europeans in search of profit? Is what we understand as the modern subject de facto a racial or racialized subject? And is this racialization the sign or marker of its modernity? Are the categories of black and white, African and European brought into being through this commerce? If so, which of these subjects is made modern in the economics of the transaction, the African or the European or both? The intersecting writings of Carby and Gilroy advance two significant points of departure to consider how the historical congruency of race thinking and its tight grip on the world of empires can be used in other ways. Their work prompts a reconsideration of modern, modernity's primacy as an origin point for racialization as part of a Manichaean fantasy. The question of lingering political consequences of being unwilling to part with the scripts of differentiation. Consequently, this thinking asks readers to imagine race otherwise, to engage with a different direction for the construction of our, our conversations about race. Carpe's questioning of the genesis of race points to a desire to produce oneself anew, to rethink how we might locate Blackness as part of a dynamic of post-colonial ge geographies that are already intermeshed with a colonizer's real and imagined borders. Everybody puts an unusual spin on this desire to rethink the situation of Blackness by positioning it within antecedent moments of global circulation and encounter that offer a different trajectory to the creation of the modern subject, and thus offers a space for race to be produced anew. He uses this pre-modern play to attempt emancipatory narratival acts. This positioning of the play potentially offers a productive counter framework to the conceptual labyrinths that too often lead scholarly conversations into intellectual dead ends. I would contend that the usher's presentation of the play's transmission through time uh, that we see here um, makes clear that a historical frame beginning with modernity and the rise of capitalism is not the only one through which encounter can be read. This is not to say that race doesn't ever appear in the play. Indeed, race emerges as a flashpoint among characters. In one of the self-destructive scenes, an unnamed character comments on the, the use of Black vernacular in everybody's visions, which leads to several prolonged discussions of what it, might, what it means to have a racialized subconscious. And there's going to be a little bit of a person here. I'm sorry. Uh, no, you literally racialized my subconscious. That's crazy. People are allowed to speak however the fuck they want in my dream space, OK? Oh my god, no one was racializing your I was making a joke. Oh, really? What was the joke? I, I just, it's not how you normally talk, okay? I was pointing that out. What the fuck would you know about how I normally talk? Maybe the way I talk when I'm not, when I talk when I'm not around you is normal. And when you're around, I put on an ugly fucking accent so you won't feel so bad about how stupid you sound. Did you ever think about that? <laughs> the play keeps in tension the pulls of the self conscious writer who attempts to keep his subconscious free of race and the social pressures implicit in giving voice to his humanity. Given the structure of the play, A could, stand, uh, could well stand in for an audience caught unawares that the racial terms of the play are being negotiated, despite the play's de-racializing contrivance. 
The space's appearance for race shifts from the visual cues an octa room hinges upon to temporal and narratival ones. Race emerges as a byproduct of A's observation of everybody's language, pointedly not his body. It becomes an artifact, both like and unlike the others that either abandon everybody or aid them as uh, they progress to death. Race is as immaterial as any of the other allegorical values everybody encounters, like friendship or love or the five senses, and yet has none of the weight these other aspects of everybody's life have. These other values function purely allegorically, serving to universalize the experience of approaching death, whereas race operates obliquely, opaquely, and divisively. Everybody's unnamed companions eventually abandon everybody because they disagree about the disjunction between the racial performance of his subconscious and how he performs it for them. It's unclear how to read everybody's friends being unable to accompany him to, uh, it's clear how to read everybody's friends being unable to accompany him to his grave. Right? That's like the kind of most common way of understanding how every man in the body would work. But it's wholly, un it's wholly ambiguous how to read his real friends abandoning him because of their different racial politics and racial presentations. These added scenes have no parallel in the medieval play, and yet read as a vital intervention that pits racial interpolation against other concepts that transcend time. Race has a particularly evanescent materiality that stands at odds with the rest of the play. As a matter of racial situation in history, everybody is a particularly difficult antecedent then for everybody. As indicated by the allegorical structure of every man and everybody's historical praise this place should resist the appearance of race. It seems to be out of history, or put differently, race would be immaterial because of the universality of death. As Colvey argues, the play's historical moment is in, this, in, uh, in that sense a perpetual present, not tied down to history. Indeed, the Octoroon slyly alludes to just this problem with a winking allusion to the trap of universal <laughs> issues where the playwright says, which is why we need more white guys uh, in his play, because we're going, we're, not, we're going to talk about universal themes like justice and not social issues. <coughs> the medieval play begins much as Jacob Jenkins's play does with a statement that departicularizes de de the events to come. The summoning of every man called it is that all, of our lives ending shows how transitory we be all day, that matter is wondrous precious, but the intent of it is more gracious and sweet to bear away. The beauty of this passage is in the subtle waiting on this matter, which is counterpoised with intent. The distinction here is obscure, but productively so. Does this passage mean to contrast, as our recent edition suggests, the play's stylings and its meanings? Or perhaps this is a knowing anticipation of the questions surrounding materiality that occupy the center of the texts. Uh, everybody's lifelong fascination with goods and physical comforts becomes a central problem, that he reads matter as precious to the point of confusing price with grace. This line also contrasts how dear matter is for its ephemerality against a value system that defies calculation. And at the risk of further obfuscating the point, the line's refusal to clarify its position on the material, what matters, and the immaterial, Intersecting and competing demands on the body and the soul are entirely the point of this period set of lines. Matter is a necessary but insufficient term around which the play revolves. Everybody puts into motion without resolving the dynamic relationship between the terms as they constitute the process of encountering death. Every man describes the sudden appearance of death as demanding an account of his life as a blind matter meaning something that is obscure or a dark matter and pleads to have a reprieve from death to elucidate what this unexpected arrival can mean. In the context of Black Lives Matter and the racially motivated murders of Black people, this encounter takes on a totally different cast. Whereas in every man, death functions as a form of equality, one that all must engage, in with, engage with, uh, with clarity. When read through the specter of the facts of Black death, this dark matter reads quite literally as both something that happens without reason and without appeal, but it's also a matter that happens in invisibilized spaces where the facts of death can be affirmed without any counter facts. This impression is only somewhat mitigated by the strange temporality of the play. When death confronts every man, he already seems to be deemed guilty. Death says, before God thou shalt answer and show thy many bad deeds and good but a few. Nonetheless, every man has a space to appeal this judgment whereas everybody is haunted by the cruelty of there being no space for grace. Love becomes his advocate rather than good deeds. So I engage in this excursus into every man to set up why this is a particularly difficult intertext, intertext with everybody and anticipate Jacob Jenkins's productive appropriation. 
Even this sh the title shift from man to body signals a narrative distance that suggests that what the new play is up to far beyond adaptation. The change both updates and signals some degree of suspicion of the source material. It reads, its, reads itself of the medieval source, source's male normativity and distances itself from its Christian roots. The shift frames a larger stakes of the play as it advances the critical moves around visibility and materiality in relationship, in relationship to race Jacob Jenkins introduces in an afternoon. The former play reads as clearly in conversation with Black Lives Matter movement, and particularly its politics about making the Black body visible through the display of a lynched Black person that he uses to decenter the audience's attention from the exceptional liminal whiteness of the tragic Mulata. The play refocuses on the mundane experience of Blackness and how the winds of white power can radically alter the trajectory of Black lives. If the emphasis in the Nocturun is on the lives as a means of thinking about material conditions, everybody functions as in the obverse, placing its emphasis on death and the immaterial. Materiality and ephemerality and visibility are the touchstones of everybody. So to return to this theater space of everybody, the stage is set for racial appearance and is intimately tied with the deathward march of everybody. In this respect, the play twists the relationship between race and death in the space of appearance as it asks to what extent race makes coherent and visible the author's conscious. The play's mechanics function as a type of blind reckoning, troubling the self-evident nature of race. It does not merely indicate the particular vulnerability of black bodies or conflate the space of appearance with that of precarity and death. And here again, this is a departure from an actor room which begin, begins with the, the naked black body on stage and the declaration about the play being about black bodies. Like every man's account book, which is depicted as illegible but damning, race seems to be both ponderous and obscure. It does not abandon him as his other allies do, um, and yet at the same time does not provide the aid love ultimately extends as a final companion to the grave. Moreover, it's not necessarily marked on the body of the actor. While at first it appears as a joke and the interludes of the play, it becomes clear that the spectral apparition of race has a purchase in the real world, different than the other traits that encumber of him and none of the benefits of the ones that propel him forward. As an obscure part of everybody's account, it potentially obstructs the play's ability to magnify the matters that matter. <coughs> everybody following every man outright objects all mundane materiality. Everybody has love accompanying him to the grave just as every man in this the act the aid of good deeds. The effective turn the play takes on as everybody descends into his grave calls into question the efficacy of feeling as a repost to the broader political concerns Jacob Jenkins raises as a Black playwright who puts that identity on stage as part of his performance. In an after room, the character of BJJ mulls over whatever it is you learn from theater, sympathy, compassion, maybe even understanding, he says. This is to say that far from reading the colorblind casting and the sly entrance of race into the play as a move away from the politics of race towards universal meaning, it signifies an anxiety that's intimately connected with death. This problem recalls Toni Morrison puzzling over the place of race in her own work, whether it's possible to read race in a way that is her own, or if it would constitute a fantasy that cannot grapple with the reality of white supremacy as a death day ideology. She writes about her future projects in terms of echo the anxieties and experimentation of every man. She writes, in my current project, I want to see whether or not race-specific, race-free language is possible and meaningful in narration. And I want to inhabit, walk around a site clear of racial detritus, a place where race both matters and is rendered impotent, a place already made for me both snug and wide open. As was the case of everybody, race functions spectrally, bulking large, and at the same time becoming powerless. It is both like the matter that clutters everybody's life, the racial detritus, but also signifies an ennobling space of love. So to draw these threads of exploration together, I will bring together to the fore Christina Sharp's argument in, in the wake, which has created the contours of what has come before the whole uh, lecture I'm giving today. I vote in the wake in part because everybody is structured as a type of preemptive wake, with characters coming to terms with the death of a companion. The play also thinks about the ontological status of blackness as it relates to affective modes, which is one of the main planks of Sharp's intervention. Uh, and I don't think I, I, I include this quote here. Yeah, um, I want to think I, I want to think care in the wake as a problem for thinking of for and a, and of, of and for black non-being in the world. Put another way, in the wake on blackness and being is a work that insists and performs that thinking needs care, uh, and that thinking and care need to stay in the wake, she writes. 
However, the relationship between Sharp's theories and everybody is a transverse one. While they're both concerned with being and non-being, everybody is a starter, starting in its utter, utter lack of preoccupation with the specificity of life, particularly Black life. Race becomes a pivotal issue within the play, but it's not carry the same kind of bold-faced clarity or historical situatedness in Octoroon does. Rather, in putting these texts in conversation, I would argue that what emerges are similar attempts to reframe Blackness through temporal and effective interventions. So I want to end this talk with a kind of transverse reading of Sharp to cut across the wide wake that her work leaves that might help bring into focus some of the possibilities opened by everybody as an adaptation of every man. Sharp ends one of her chapters in the wake, discussing an installation of a project uh, by Kara Walker in New York City, uh, New York City's now demolished Domino Sugar Factory, uh, called, and it has a wonderfully long name, a subtlety or the marvelous sugar baby, an homage to the unpaid and overworked artisans who refine our sweet tastes from the sugar canes to the kitchens of the new world on the occasion of the demolition of the Domino Sugar Refining Plant. So this work is a massive white figure that is crossed between a sphinx and a stereotypical mammy with bared breasts, full lips, and a head wrap that is accompanied by a molasses colored worker boys. Sharp puts works, uh, Walker's work to unusual use. She at first uh, describes a place of detachment that Walker arrives at when she works, when she feels as though she's kind of detaches from her skin so she can look at the underside of her face. Sharp follows this by discussing the history of the idea of the subtlety, which has its European origins as a medieval dish that was at times used as a political sculpture and in the hands of Walker functions as a deep, in a deeply medieval way as a pre-capitalist work of art meant to forge relationships in ways that cannot be done through financial exchange. Walker does all of this while keeping in the air a host of other meanings about exploitation and the relationships among sweetness, whiteness, industry, and slavery. Perhaps most importantly, the work as necessarily ephemeral is about erasure. Walker was able to put the sculpture into this factory because it was meant to be demolished. And she constructed the sculpture out of consumable material from which the brown byproduct has been removed as though to monumentalize the vanishing connections between industry, race, cap and capitalism in prominent urban spaces. There's another way to approach this project that is suggested by Sharp, but not pursued by her because her argument has other ends. The framing Sharp gives to a subtlety suggests effective and temporal modes that interrupt the chain of slavery to modern invisibilization, either through death or incarceration. Walker's title is ironic in many ways, particularly because it seems emphatically not subtle. And the artist, uh, and by the artist's mission, it's not meant to be subtle, right? It's this gigantic piece. And yet its relationship to the past and its apparent meanings belie a transverse history to the wake of slavery. Walker's conception of a subtlety relied in part on Sidney Mintz's sweetness and power, the place of sugar in modern history. It's from him that she learns the deeper history of the word subtlety in relationship to sugar and confections, which she described as beautiful poetic gestures. She continues in an interview to position the historical situation of the term in relationship to her own work, saying, the quality of the thing that's really big, powerful, and uncanny that contains all these histories I'm interested in, ancient histories and more contemporary histories, is like a new world sphinx. This idea of the new world sphinx made between medieval and modern history, an assemblage of unlike things that create a novel being, is an evocative one that indicates a temporal political connections Walker's art forges. Mintz underscores a slow migration of the process of sugar making as it made its way from Northern Africa to Europe in terms that cannot but seem metaphorical. By the 16th century, the habit of using sugar as decoration spread through continental Europe from Northern Africa and particularly Egypt to percolate downwards from the nobility, first Joshua Gross's wife. To make modern white sugar, one boils off water until the sucrose, the sucrose crystallizes and purees are removed. After a few more complex steps, the molasses is removed from the brown crystals by centrifugation. But early sugars could not be refined to the whiteness of modern sugars, since the refining techniques were limited. They weren't very white, and the whiter, the more expensive. European preferences for the whitest sugars may have uh, been imitations of, of the Arabs, among whom sugar consumption was already an ancient habit. But the association between whiteness and purity was also ancient in Europe. The movement of sugar across a, a swath of the globe does not only speak an evolution of taste, but a variety of pre-capitalist forms of exchange and movement that gradually became lost as Western European society fully absorbed white sugar into its culture. 
as mince ominously suggests, when sugar became wholly enfolded into regional fantasies of whiteness and purity, and its connection to other bodies and other places was rendered invisible. Not surprisingly, Walker evokes another pre-capitalist gesture that has particularly medieval overtones in describing her installation as a gift, as a means of drawing people together into a bond beyond transaction itself. It is a social gesture that leaves a very different wake than one of the one of financial exchange. The New World Sphinx is in, in the hands of Walker is not just a sculpture, but the relationship she forges between the past and the present for the public that suggests an, al suggests an alternative and lasting vision that reintroduces brown and black bodies into the discourse of sweetness in the construction of the modern world. I use the example of Walker as read by Sharp to illustrate what I think Jacob Jenkins accomplishes with everybody. The main intervention of everybody is its temporal and political one. To borrow a phrase from science fiction studies, it's retrofuturistic, a term uh, Karu Ishin uses in his further considerations of Afrofuturism. Writing, the field of Afrofuturism does not seek to deny the tradition of counter memory, Rather, it aims to extend that tradition by reorienting the intercultural vectors of Black Atlantic towards the proleptic as much as the retrospective. By engaging with the Middle Ages, the play seems to, seeks to reframe, uh, seems, seems to seek a frame that is larger than one offered by an octoroon. Jacob Jenkins offers a pre-capitalist, pre-slavery narrative that he overlays upon the contemporary political world to conceptualize it anew. What emerges is like Walker's in World Sphinx which sutures a medieval model of conceptualizing death onto a vision of race that challenges many of our habits for visualizing what race looks like, and just, and just as importantly, what the endpoints of racialization might be. And again, uh, this again reiterates the danger of the play. It reads like some type of pre-racial fantasy down to its ending, which simply asks people to be better to one another. A can't we all get along type of response that is inadequate to the circumstances. In fact, the play, uh, um, Everybody, winds to its conclusion with a, a similar sort of undecidedness that threatened to undermine the play in Octoroon. After quoting the medieval play, the usher offers what seems like a series of platitudes rather that seem to simplify rather than complicate. Uh, the usher says, for after death amends no man, may no man make, for then mercy and pity doth him forsake, or something. Maybe let's all be a little bit better about recycling. Also really, really listening to each other and maybe less judgmental and more forgiving, but also owning up to our mistakes and being open to changing our minds, our own minds, leading with our understanding, you know, just be nice to each other for once. And I'm talking about everybody. It reads as though Jacob Chickens cannot make up his, cannot commit to a rationale about the utility of the play, making a joke, and floating some half-hearted suggestions for improvement uh, that blanket all viewers without recognizing differential burdens upon audience members particularly the facts about the deaths of Black people that we know too well. As I've noted above, this play is a counterfactual. And here I want to return to the specific idea of the counterfactual Wesley Morris created that I quoted at the beginning of his talk, the idea of a counterfactual that could save a life. This play reads as far as possible, uh, uh, far from that as possible, as the only end point of the play is death. However, the retrofuturistic construction of the play is linking of a deep past to the future disrupts the modern calculus that links the cradle to the grave for black people that reads black life and black death occupying. Did I just lose the, oh, it just died. It just died? It just died. I'll be loud. I'm, I only have one more page left. <laughs> Go ahead. You see if this yeah. Going. Um, that reads black, uh, that, that, oh yeah, we're back. Awesome, thank you. So uh, that's, that reads as far as possible as the only end point of the play's death. However, the retrofuturistic construction of the play, its linking of a deep past to the future disrupts the modern calculus that links the cradle to the grave for Black people, that reads Black life and Black death occupying the same ontological space. In uncoupling life and death, the play shifts from lingering on the performance of race to questioning the performance of knowledge. And here I'm borrowing a framework from Eve, uh, 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 Steve Sedgwick's essay on reparative reading that suggests that this is a means of finding a new way of knowing to establish new facts that can lead to new ends. The prohibitive problem, however, has been to has been in the limitations of present theoretical vocabularies rather than in a reparative mode itself. No less acute than a paranoid position, no less realistic, no less attached to the project of survival, and no less nor more delusional or phantasmic. 
the reparative reading position undertakes a different range of affects, ambitions, and risks. What we can best learn from such practices are perhaps the many, uh, many ways selves and communities succeed in extracting sustenance from the objects of a culture, even a culture whose avowed desire has been so not to sustain them. The apologetic, sincere, unhopeful uncertain hopeful conclusion is a version of what I might call excessive blackness. It is a performance of black thought that is wholly unexpected, but is part of a strategy that creates a, a that tries to create a politics that can sustain black life, even in temporal, political, and dramatic spaces that at first seem unsuitable to black appearance or to the appearance of blackness. The disappearance of race on the stage is a risky departure for an author who up to this point uh, has put his ambitions as a writer about race to the forefront of his work. Even in the play where there are only white people, he does have like black uh, black actors kind of in the background or in, uh, in kind of like appearing in books or appearing as uh, kind of critical plot points. So this risk is an unusual one because it carries none of the sensationalism found in his other plays where the shock of racism's le legacies is the gambit he plays before the audience to lay claim to the seriousness of the drama. The venture into a different vocabulary for race that simultaneously holds the logic of a racist world and the possibility of one in which race is interstitial rather than constitutive. A vocabulary that draws on an early dramatic lexicon placed within a reparative grammar and syntax. The ambition of this play is perhaps best expressed in a more felicitous and perhaps coincidental echo of the final lines of W.E.D. Du Bois's Dark Princess, a romance. Du Bois ends his picaresque romance with the line, which is real, the dream of the spirit or the pain of the bone, an allusion to Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, but also a crux in the responsibility of uh, the responsibilities of black author in representing race. Similarly, everybody after losing his friends to their disagreements about race is suspicious of love who offers to accompany him to the grave. The possibility that dream and fact can proceed hand in hand can be a counterfact. Everybody asks love, his ultimate companion to the afterlife, is this real or is this a dream? To which love replies, this is a theater. Thank you, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Byrne. <laughs> really, um, so much interesting um, information about this play that I'm not, I wasn't familiar with. It. Even stuck a little art in there. <laughs> yeah, I even recognize it. <laughs> so as we talked about before, um literature and visual arts you know have uh, a connected they are artistic forms so so we have that in common um as part of our study will you take some questions for sure okay, questions. how senior do i have to be before i can start saying no to that question are there questions for Dr. Rooney? it's a really you know rich topic please I don't want to step on anything. Does Jacob Jenkins specify the racial identities of the actors? So is it up to the production? It's up to the production. He wants a, a diverse array of, of actors. That's the only kind of specification, which is really unusual for him. Like mostly he often will specify like down to like the like kind of like incredible minutia who he wants to be cast how and how they want to be perceived. And in this play, it's a, a complete departure, which is what I think find to be so interesting about the play because he's rejecting universalization, but he's also kind of accepting it in some other ways too. Can I jump on the end of that? Please. Um, do you think it's because he is using this medieval foundation rather than the kind of 19th century background for an author? Right. There just seem to be such, such really dramatic differences um, and how he's conceiving of these characters. I mean, I think he he's playing with the idea of the medieval as universal in a really interesting way, right? And then complicating to what extent this the, a drama can be universal too, right? So thinking, I, I think the, the phrase he uses mimetic inter iterations or saying that this play can't just be solely located in the Middle Ages, but because we, because it is located in the Middle Ages in most of our imaginations, we think of it as universal, but it has to be universal in a radically different so I think, yeah, I think that he is thinking about it as different than a 19th century in terms of its different historical situation, but even that has its own implications as a historical situation mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. 
in everybody, do you think that um, uh, I'm forgetting, uh, Brandon J J Jenkins? Is it's a fun name to say. Yeah. <laughs> is he commenting or is he attempting to provide a critique of the sort of risk to leave metaphysics of substance action and, you know, sort of playing with, you know, this idea of race as an accident of being? Oh, that is really lovely. I, I, I have not thought of that, but like I, I want to make a note of that because I think that's really smart. Um, and I think that they, that's part of it. That's part of what I was trying to get at. And this is, a nut, I've, been, I've been, you know, this is all recent work and I'm still thinking through lots of parts of it. And I think that this is the nut I've been trying to crack about the allegorical, oh, thank you, the allegorical representation of, uh, of this. Uh, because like, as I, as I was struggling with is the idea of, to what extent is race part of an allegorical mode, right? And as a little, it's not, it can't possibly be. And so I think you're right. I think he is playing with that, but maybe not in those, in such yeah, clear terms. Such right. It seems like that might be there in the background and it'll be consistent with the, with the medieval. Right? right, right. That's really lovely. Yeah, thank you. It looks like you have a second part of this. No, no, no. Okay, and I, I don't know what you would do. Yeah, yeah, but I, I do think that you're you're right that like it's it, it's it's so interesting that like race like is a, a character on some level in the play, but doesn't actually appear as a character. So it does seem to be like kind of functioning in a, a fundamentally different way. Yeah, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Could you expand on the fourteenth century play and like? Right. I so I this is this is where you'll see the clay feet of my my knowledge because I'm not a drama scholar. But um, so if anybody is like someone who studies drama, please like jump in. I'm I'm more familiar with like the the uh, York uh, cycles than anything else. But um, what I mean, do you know anything about this? I I feel like I know very I start vanishingly little. Yeah, I'm sorry. I feel like I can't answer this question in a way that I would not feel embarrassed about. So <laughs> um, and so uh, what well, could you? Is there anything other than its actual performance history? Because I, I don't know how it was performed because I don't think it was performed in, I, I don't think we have as much about the performance history as we do about other performance histories, right? Because we have other notes about other players. No, I was just curious. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is there something you wanted, wanted to get out of it? Or like, I still want to give you something. Yeah, okay. Just curious. All right, thanks. Yes. Is there any connection with the all mystery plays. Mm -hmm. is this, a mystery? this is not a mystery play, no. Okay. Mm. Right, right. Okay. No, like the, uh, yeah, this is not put on by, uh, this is one thing I can tell you, they were not put on by guilds the way that the mystery plays were. So it doesn't have that same kind of like, you know, performance history of it being performed in like the, in the sort of space of the real world, right? Like some of like, wish I, I at least, again, I, I don't want to say something that is absolutely wrong in case I, I, I'm, I'm totally misleading you, but I don't think it has that performance history that the mystery plays do. So it doesn't have the kind of punchiness that I would like it to have. There is, it's very minimal. There is like almost, it's mostly empty space. And so like at, at some point you have a grave that appears and at some point you have objects that are sort of on the stage. But again, we, there's very little like kind of like what we want as like modern apparatus inside of the play. So you would have to, we'd have to guess at a whole bunch of the things, but there's just a few indicators of where things are positioned and that's it. Um, I was thinking a little bit more about the position you have with the game from where he was thinking, where he was mentioning the Dutch play, the Dutch play, but then also the white book. Yes. Um, and then several of the jokes about it. Yeah. Um, and I think it's maybe because it's a way of displacing the Englishness of it, but also the Eastern framework. Mm -hmm. And when you that connect to some of the real conversation. Right, right. And so, right. And so this is, yeah, this is getting at this kind of question about the sort of universalizing of the play, right? And so can you, how, what is productive about the, that kind of displacement? And can you then think about race differently if you have to think about it through those different terms? And also, how do you do think about philosophy differently if you have to think about it through those yeah, different terms as well? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Question about um, the, the contrast between 
what sounds like the final moments of the of the quote place where um, it sounded like every man had um, the other man and uh, some kind of good deeds. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, his good deeds follow. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then every um, body having um, love. Mm -hmm. So good deeds and love. I was trying to kind of wrap my head around that. Um, why he would change that? Right. And my immediate thought is going back to your analysis of um, vulnerability of black bodies mm -hmm. and deeds, perhaps not faring them well towards. Yeah. That. And how do you can you can you explore that? Like, and some of because and some of your deeds don't matter in terms yeah. of thinking about your black a black body, right? Like right. like I, this is what I was trying to get at in the very beginning, where like people being surprised by death despite love them doing good deeds right, right? <laughs> where they are when they find this right yeah. right exactly and so uh it's trying to give uh a kind of different a different spin to the possibility of what redemption could look like by kind of countering the kind of the logic that if you do good deeds good things will happen to you or you will be remembered well or something like that and that being insufficient uh, and so I think that that's part of like how Rich is also appearing inside of this by sort of uh, trying to alter what accompanies him to the grave. But it's, but it's a tricky thing, right? It's a tricky thing to say that love can be the thing that brings someone, that accompanies one to the grave because it's like that, that I mean, maybe, maybe we're just cynical or maybe I'm just cynical. But <laughs> like, it feels like, uh, like the idea of having love accompany to the grave seems like a, a kind of not, not enough, but not right. Hmm. Just interesting. Yeah. Choice on the part of yeah. Jacob Jenkins. Yeah. Other thoughts or questions? Great. So I, I have to give two caveats before asking my question. One is, uh, I, you know, my question might be simply, it might be the answer might be obvious to someone who's not in the, the state of ignorance I'm in, <laughs> which is that I do not know the original play, every man. Okay. And then the other thing is, I, you know, I recognize you're not Jacob Jenkins, yeah. um, so this is maybe an unfair question, but why why did Jacob Jenkins reach so far back um, for, you know, a, a play from the 1400s, something that for the vast majority of the modern audience is going to be completely unknown? Do you think it's more that the actual, you know, messages, themes, uh, and so forth in the play itself, or do you think he was actually he wanted to find something that was that distance that he wanted to you know, work with that time period or that mm -hmm. cultural the, the, the tremendous differences of mm -hmm. that time? Period? This is interesting. I, I I have two answers to this. One I'm, I'm less comfortable with than the other. One is. Uh, even though I see what you're saying about the, about like the kind of once unfamiliarity with every man and how distant it seems, it's actually reproduced surprisingly often. Like every man has like a lot of like re modern reiterations. People for some reason like putting on every man. Uh, it's like and I don't know if it's because of a kind of a sort of wanting to put on something from the Middle Ages, and so that's the easiest one to put on rather than a mystery play or something like that because mystery plays are are technically difficult in a lot of ways. But every man is like it seems to be a, a common play to be put on. So I wonder if he's partially responding to maybe the kind of the life that every man seems to have and wanting to uh, counteract the kind of language around every man in its popularity, uh, what, what, what popularity it has. But I also wonder about the, that question, that, that, that quote I had a, a while ago about, uh, we don't need to turn uh, off the light, but you can kind of see this about this idea of social issues and what counts as a social issue, right? And I think that he's playing with the idea of uh, this, this socially distant play, this play that seems to be about not any social issue in particular, but like death itself, uh, and then kind of sort of saying death itself is a social issue, right? And so trying to play with like the, the seemingly distance of the play to try to, uh, to, try to, um, to draw upon that distance to do something interesting with it. Yeah, thank you. Um, could you give us a little more, give me a little more, I've never heard the term reparative read, read before. Mm -hmm. And is it is it a form of critical reading or is, is it also a form of what you choose to read? And how you choose to read? Oh, that's interesting. What, what do you mean by that that last bit? Well, I mean, I, I was just trying to work mm -hmm. through what, what, what the term could mean and how, right. how, 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 how reparative reading. 
Right. I mean, this is like a way, a way of reading as a kind of like mode of reclamation, right? Sort of saying that there's this thing that is hostile to uh, to the person who is reading it, but wanting to find some some good out of that reading as well. So as a way of like kind of breaking out of the suspicion of of a text and then trying to engage it in terms of like claiming something of it for oneself, right? And so I think it's a particularly powerful mood that like uh, Jacob Jenkins makes because a few of his plays are uh, doing this kind of reparative uh, work of sort of saying, here's this other play that seems to be toxic, hostile, but there's something interesting here that I could use and then I can inhabit. And so I would see this as a kind of mode of reparative reading. Any other comments or questions? Well, then let's thank Dr. Murray. <coughs>